MMA fans. Welcome to another episode of the Calf Kick Experience here at the CKE on May 13th, 2021, the Thursday night before UFC 262. The next belt contention and contention for probably the most coveted belt in the entire promotion. I'm your host, Zach, the grinning ghoul of the Southeast, Gleason, here with my co-host as usual, Gage, big game, no shame, Hamby. How's it going, Gage, brother, sir? What's up, bruh? Let's fucking get it. Drinking on a fucking Thursday. Say we're doing something a little bit new, sharing a drink on the podcast together. We're both 22, working on 23, so drink responsibly. Nothing illegal going on here. What are you drinking? I have a little Jim Beam and Coke going on here in my LSU cup. I don't know if y'all can see that. Probably not. But um, I got some vodka and water right here because I'm a crazy son of a bitch. Trying to stay hydrated. I respect the game. So let's get into last week. Let's talk about how we did last week, May 8th, between Bellator and UFC. Where do you want to start? I mean, let's start from the top of the Bellator card. We didn't do that great last week in Bellator, I tell you that. No, last last week in Bellator, we did not do very hot. Let's see. We hit on two of four, and if I would have bet the money on it the way I should have, I would have walked out minus $59. So not horrible, but, you know, we hammered Juan Archuleta, which was a problem. That was our big money bet, and he lost. Let's talk about the young man, Sergio Pettis. I believe only 23 years old. Yeah, Showtime's little brother, man. He balled out and he beat, in my opinion, one of the best uh, bantamweights in the world. And now he's presumably one of the best, you know? I was about to say. He showed all facets of the game and went into a big fight, you know, obviously the underdog, and came out on top in a five-round decision. And it was pretty decisive. Yeah, no, he fought well, and I don't, I, I don't think the moment got to him in any way, shape, or fashion. In fact, I think he kind of, kind of lived up to the Showtime mantra and owned the moment, kind of made it his own. So, congrats to Sergio Pettis. That was pretty incredible. Uh, let's see, where else did we miss on the Bellator card? Patricky Patricky Pitbull. We did not do well on that one either. No, that one that one was a little bit more tough to swallow than the one Archuleta one too. That was tough. I think uh, I think we would have been better off if that was Patricio. Yeah, no, hundred <laughs> percent. I think what's put what is Patricky now? Thirty six, thirty seven. He's up. I mean, not not done by any means, but like you said, definitely getting up there a little bit. Yeah, so we let's talk that about, one now. Now let's go ahead and talk about his uh, pupil in the fight before that. The lightweight. Grand Prix, we had Rumble Johnson taking on, what's his name? I forgot his name. Augusto. Augusto, that's right. And uh, that was it. That was actually a pretty good fight and right up until uh, Augusto got knocked out. He had uh, Rumble on the ropes, man. No, yeah, he dropped Rumble in the first round, right? That That's correct, man. He had, I was about to look like a freaking genius, but, you know. Yeah, with Rumble, your value bet. Hey, Rumble the Felon Johnson. Oh, man, that was the craziest thing ever. I literally thought when I saw that headline pop up that, you know, there's probably a million people named Anthony Johnson, and they just put the wrong guy's picture up as the mugshot. Absolutely not. Anthony Rumble Johnson is expected in court on June 8th for buying a $500 plane ticket on a stolen credit card. So if this ends up being true, I'm, you know, he probably works his way out of it, probably has enough money to pay for a good lawyer, but what an idiot, man. He I mean, that's the, that million dollar paycheck from the Grand Prix. I just mean, come on now. But I guess it is what it is because – at the end of the day, Rumble started slow. Like we said, he hadn't been in a real fight, a real MMA comp- like competitive atmosphere in, what, four years? So he started slow but got the job done. I definitely think Nimkov is going to be a lot more of a challenge. I definitely Absolutely. think Yoel Romero probably, probably would have 
made us lose a little bit more money had that been the fight. Yeah, but, I mean, you have a very good point there. I mean, it'd be interesting to see if their fight goes on as scheduled. I'm not sure when the next uh, section of the Grand Prix is going on, mm -hmm. but it'd be interesting to see if there's any disciplinary action by Bellator or any of the governing uh, bodies. Uh, like the, was it the Connecticut State yeah, Athletic so Commission? It's New Jersey, I believe. They're fighting Atlantic City. Oh, okay. Like that. Wait, did you see, did you see that? Speak just to go off track and do as we do, but the Fabricio Verdum thing? Uh, I saw the headline. I did not have time to click on it, though. Dude, it was crazy. So he's got, That's he's got the guy. PFL? Yeah, PFL. Okay. He's got the guy in, you know, the signature Verdum arm tri triangle. He's choking him out. And the guy, the way I saw it, I, you know, by definition, a tap is more than one slap open-handed to either the opponent or the mat. You know what I mean? But I don't know, man. It looked like this dude tapped. It really did. So regardless, what happened was the guy ends up slipping out of the arm triangle gets up, knocks Verdum out, gets his big upset, and then unprovoked, not because of an appeal, not because somebody asked them to, but the New Jersey State Athletic Commission says, let's go take a look at this. They go look at it and overturn the decision, turn it into a no contest because they said, oh, no, he definitely tapped. But the crazy part about it is there were so many, you know, it looked like he tapped and then changed his mind, honestly, if we're really talking about it, because it was two to the back of the shoulder. And then he said, oh, no, I'm actually good. Let me start punching him in the head again. Let me start punching him in the head again. But really? I, think the big, I think the big factor, and, you know, the crazy part about it was that Verdun never let the choke go. He never loosened up on him. He never said, I felt the tap, so I let him go, and that's why I lost. So... I think it's really actually a insane that unprovoked New Jersey went and played with that result. So if I'm the other guy who's Ferreira or Fer something like that, I can't remember his name exactly. But I'm going to go freaking petition against the state athletic commission to see if I can get my win back. I don't know if that was in a tournament or how that worked, but like, it's crazy. I know you could argue the other side of, well, they fight till the ref pulls them off and the ref never got in there. Okay, yeah, maybe, but still unprovoked. Like, I didn't end, get, end up getting a chance to look the stat up, but Nevada you, doesn't do that. Like, you, you have to, did you recognize who the referee was? Uh-uh. Okay. Let's see. Let me look. You, I mean, because you could have some joker in there that doesn't know what the hell they're doing. Like, you should have called it. Or, you know, obviously you could have Herb Deem in there. And see, you know, Herb Dean, I, my opinion, one of the best that there is, you know? Yeah. Renan Ferreira was the guy's name. That's crazy, though. I can't believe that uh, he slipped out of it, even though, you know, Verdum said that he didn't let go of the choke and then continued to knock him out. You'll never but, guess who the ref was. Herb Dean. Peterson. Who the fuck is that? The guy that freaking Dominic Cruz hates said, I won't fight if Keith Peterson's refing. Oh, Keith Peterson. Yeah. Like, Keith Peterson kind of sucks. Like, he's better than some, but he ain't that great. I mean, he literally, hypothetically in this scenario here, missed a tap. So, yeah, that's pretty rough. That's that's not the best look. But Let's get back to uh, Bellator. On a more direct note, the one that we hit on and hit on absolutely right last week, Michael Venom Page, that dude looked good. Uh, I told you, man, he comes out and he top tier striking, like I, like I said. And uh, he rearranged that dude's face, literally. He placed his nose from here over here. Yeah, that, that was, was real disgusting. bad. Disgusting. No, that was bad. No, I'd never really watched in full time, watched a whole time, like a whole fight of his. You know, I'd seen the YouTube replays and the highlights and stuff, but never like a full live fight. And I freaking loved it, man. The way that he moves, he bounces around. And I, I kind of at first hated the fact that like his hands are like down by his waist, like doing some weird thing in fists. And I'm like, could be, you know, like 
trying to protect yourself, but he's so quick and he depends so much on his reaction time. He doesn't need to. Yeah, I mean, just like, down there. just like Wonder Boy and just like Sean O'Malley, they have their hands at their hips, but they're so deadly because, you know, the other guy's up here and they don't see the punches coming from below the waist. No, and 100% from with the hands are down there, with the hands by the hips, excuse me, you, you could throw better kicks. You throw more powerful kicks. You can add that as a bigger weapon in your arsenal because you can move a little bit better, generate more force. I mean, okay. I literally saw a dude get kicked in the face. We'll get – remind me when we talk about Tony, Tony Ferguson in a while, while about the hands being low and head movement. I, I got some insight. Bingo. But Michael Venom Page, that dude, the real deal. I would love, I would love to see him as one of the next Michael Chandlers to cross over and move into the UFC after being a top contender, belt holder, former champion. No, no, he, I was he, about to say. So last week, I was saying that he should fight Diego or not Diego Lima. Is that his name? Douglas Lee, Lima. Douglas Diego is his brother in the UFC. A yeah. Douglas Lima. And I didn't know if they fought, but I remembered that I went back. Douglas Lima versus MVP happened already for the belt. That was the only Douglas person that beat him. Douglas caught him with an uppercut. My opinion wasn't lucky. I think that, you know, if I think it was a slip. It might have been a slip or a kick. Can't really remember. Yeah. But it was kind of lucky, in my opinion. I'd love to see them run that back. Well, I was about to say, Michael Venom Page is, what, 19-1 and one now, I believe, and that's the only loss. I think he should get another shot at the belt. I don't I, I don't imagine that there's anybody else in Bellator that's a top contender that he hasn't fought and beaten. I think belt is the only real decision for him at this point, especially because of how good he looked. Like, that was no slouch of a performance. I never at one point felt my butt cheeks clench together because I was nervous he was going to get killed. You know what I mean? And the crazy thing is he's got what he's, like you said, 19 and 1. He hasn't got beat by a wrestler yet. You know, same thing with Wonder Boy. He's been matched against wrestlers. I I can't really recall one off the top of my head that, like, took him down and just beat on him, you know? No, I was about to say they're it's both just quick. Yeah, when you shoot for, the, shoot for their legs, they're already out from in front of you before you even have a chance to, like, touch them. Yeah, those guys are super fast, and that's – you have to be super fast to have that kind of style. You can't – there's no heavyweights doing that. Kind of, no light heavyweights doing that. Is no, real no, Adesanya is the only middleweight that can do that, in my opinion. Michael Venom Page, the thing about him, too, is there's definitely a difference, especially as it relates to sports, in cockiness and then swagger. Michael Venom Page has that swagger where he, you know, he took the center of the octagon immediately, moving forward, bouncing around, doing his thing, he very much looks like he's fit and prepared to be one of the next big stars in this sport. Not assuming that he's not already well recognized and well noted and respected for his talents. I, I mean, just think he's one of those guys that can transcend talent and sport and become one of those stars. I, I think that the fans of MMA know who he is, absolutely. I think because he fights in Bellator, casuals don't necessarily know him as well. He needs to step up his – not obviously, but, you know, he needs to step up his notoriety. And he has a bunch of swagger. I think he has potential to become a household name. Well, especially if he wins that belt, like you said. He's got to run it back with Lima. That's the That's got to be it. I don't know if they're in Grand Prix tournament or if that was just a fight or I, – I don't know how that works in Bellator. I mean, I do, but I wasn't paying attention last weekend. <laughs> regardless anyway, I, hey there was a reason i chose him for our little thumbnail he's a bad man oh yeah hammer down michael venom hey. then we gotta now i gotta run back the ufc from last weekend real quick let's start at the i guess the bottom of the card was no, the main event was Marina Rodriguez. Who was the bottom of the card that we talked about? Gregor Gillespie? Hey, fun fact. We called that. We knew Gregor. Yeah, we got, we got Gregor Gillespie, right? Yeah, like you were saying, yeah. I was clenching my butt cheeks together for a while on that one, bro. I was like, 
Woo. Yeah, that was that one was rough. No, yeah. we hit on that. We hit on Marina Rodriguez versus Waterson. And then you, I mean, you called it, man. You hit on Alex Morono. You said Cowboy was done, and I didn't believe you. But I think Cowboy's owed at this point for what he's done for the company and because of his relationship with Dana. I think he's owed one last fight. But I, I don't think we can do any more Cowboy after that. I just, I think it's starting to get dangerous, man. I He did not... Like, he was talking all his game, like, oh, you know, I'm coming out with malice. Like, nothing yeah. against him, but I'm coming out mean. I was just saying, I was like, bro, you haven't come out and beat anybody up in years. So, I mean, so, I mean, I was right, but, like, where does he go from here? I personally think he should retire. He's tarnishing his legacy. I think I mentioned this last week when we talked, but Cowboy versus Diego Sanchez was the perfect thing the UFC could have done. Because, you know, either way, winner, retired. Loser, definitely retired. Yeah. One of them just gets to ride off into the sunset. Absolutely. I was about to say, you know what you could do? Make a BMF-style belt, put it on there one time, and let one of them take it home and be the champ forever. I mean, I don't care about that. No. no you can't call it I'm BMF. About I'm about the red panty night, son. <laughs> I just, I, you know, I'm like, give him something to compete for. But Cowboy said he wants to move down to 55, like I said, which I just don't feel makes any sense at all. All right, next, next. I'm done talking about Cowboy. This guy's washed. Yeah, cow, yeah Cowboy done. No mas, no mas Cowboy. <laughs> no mas Bacchetto. But uh, did you see uh, the, the thing that came out about Jeff Neal after his loss? He, I hit on Neal he had Magazine. trouble cutting weight, right? He was, like, stupid sick or something. Like, couldn't work out, couldn't train, couldn't do anything, and cut, like, 36 pounds a week and a half before the fight. Like, <sighs> incredibly unhealthy. Like, he, he, he looked tentative. You know, I, I picked Jeff Neal to win. I, I think yeah. he looked tentative, but when he connected, it caught Neil Magny's attention for sure. And I'll give he, you that. You know, he wasn't advanced, advancing, and he looked not like Jeff Neal, in my opinion. That doesn't give him an excuse. He lost the bout. I lost on that pick. Neil Magny came out and he won it. However, maybe if he wasn't sick, I think would have been a different story because I feel like Jeff Neal would have walked him down and would have connected a, you know, probably a KO shot because he, like, he touched him. He touched him good. No, he, uh, I guess Vegas doesn't do no contests or I'd be very willing to void that bet on both sides just because, you know, you, 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 you never bet on a fighter if you know that information, like, we, if that had come out before the fight, you would have never said, oh, yeah, Jeff Neal. And I just – I guess I got lucky on Neil Magny with that one, even though, like you said, Neil Magny kind of started off slow. Jeff Neal touched him up. But, like, Neil Magny definitely finished strong. He definitely showed a variety of striking with the knees, the clinch work, and the ability to just kind of touch him up, get in and out. And then I liked what he said after. He's, you know, they asked him about Chemaev, and he said – that fool can get it at, get his ass beat in August if he wants to. So I, mean, I, I it, it was by no means like a deciding like a decisive win. I mean, it was unanimous, but like it wasn't like oh, Neil Magny's on the rise. No, but like at this point, I mean, Chimaev's gonna have a hard time getting anybody higher rank than Neil Magny to agree to a fight with him. So. I figure take what you can get, move into the top 15, and at that point, start calling for the Colbys and the Masvidals and the people. I you think do. I think I'd like to see Damian Maia fight him. Interesting. But Interesting. we talk about this every fucking week. Y'all don't want to hear us talk about Kamai anymore. We just want to see him fight. Yeah, exactly. I love to speculate, <laughs> but until we get some real news, we could probably sh shut down the Chimaya cocksucking club for a couple hours <laughs> we hey the hype train here at cke is real yeah i was about to say maybe 
maybe we get on the YouTuber or the Instagram, the Twitter, and find the find Chamayev, get Smesh to come do an episode with us. Yo, if our 50 would be viewers fun. can find Chamaya to come talk to us, we would love that. That would be awesome. If anybody knows Hamzat Chamaya, give him our number. <laughs> okay <laughs> i was about to say now we got to start talking about the big belt weekend Twenty thousand fans our hometown the 713 h is up at the toyota center let's go baby let's bust into it hey we've that. been looking forward to this forever also dana white we're not happy with you because you try to charge us eight hundred dollars for three fucking tickets yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Let's just talk about what in the god dang doo-doo. Let me watch my mouth. What is a $105 processing fee? What the heck is that? Dana, you know, you got college kids out here that love this sport, and you're trying to screw us up. Yeah, college kids that waited weeks in line to get pre-order seats and still tried to charge us out the ball sack. Like, I was fine paying $150, $200 per ticket. And then I got to check out. I mean, out. whatever, at that point. Because we still have to like, pay for parking and shit. Like, a $150 processing fee. Yeah, that was, that was bullshit. But we've been looking forward to this card for a big minute. I was a huge, you know, proponent, arguer of Char- Charlie Olives getting the title fight after what he did to Tony Ferguson. You know, I think I would have probably preferred to see it versus Poirier personally. Just because that's the kind of douche I am when it comes to the sport, but... Hey, know. whoa, 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 pal. Let's start at the bottom of the card. We got to make these people say, Suspense. What are the, I'm not even going to say that out loud. Let's start at the bottom <laughs> of the card. Hey, let's start at the bottom, son. That's where we always start. All right. So we're going to start with Antina Shevchenko. We can oh, see so she's Nina nice and two. I think they're fighting at they're fighting at 135 or 125. I believe it's 135, but I'm not sure. I mean, I mean she has pretty good record here. Um, she's obviously lost to Roxanne Modafferi. Very cute picture there. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, what is that, man? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Roxanne. Her. Don't come and beat her ass. And then our main headliner is Caitlin Chahunigan. Yeah, Chikugian. Um, Chikagian, where the hell her name is. Yeah, whatever it is. You know how it goes. We're good with names here at CKE, but we're good about picking fights. Mm-hmm. We try to be. Anyways, yeah. we got her at 9-2. and two. Zach, um, she's fighting Andrea Lee. Yes, Andrea Lee. And I got yeah. the odds on that right now. With Shevchenko as a minus 175 favorite and Andrea Lee as the underdog with plus 145 odds. And uh, as you can see here, we have Andrea Lee coming out 11 and 5. She's on a a three-fight skid. skid. She won her first three in the UFC, though. But, like, quality names here. Again, they both have a common loss in Roxanne Modafari, who's a ground-and-pound kind of fighter. I was about to say she's bad for sure. Jojo Calderwood's one of the dogs at any weight in the women's weight class in the promotion. Absolutely. She's very good. Um, Your discretion advised here because we're about to make you boys grease grease your gators. Oh, don't grease your gator on me, bro. She. Hey, KGB looking nice, son. Oh, no, you did not just take this podcast there. All right, all right, I can't, I can't. Wait, one more, <laughs> one more, one more, one more. He right said here. one more. Right one. Oh, Ooh. I didn't just say that out loud. I love you, girlfriend. Hey, something, hey, we're trying to diversify this podcast here, folks. I was about to say, if y'all don't like what we're doing, don't watch, but we're going to do it anyway, probably. Yeah, there's not many of these ladies that are as sexy as this out there, especially in the UFC. I was about to say, especially in the UFC. <laughs> she uh, <laughs> she could have it all, son. Anywho. No, so- not giving it all to her. I'm out on it. 
Just two inches. Publicly known, I'm out on Bone and the KGB girl. So. All jokes aside, who are you taking here? You taking the older sister of the bullet, the champion? See, you know why I'm taking the older sister of the bullet, the champion? Is because of how good the bullet, the champion looked on the Usman Masvidal card last time we saw her. They train together, they're sisters, they're together all the time. I can only imagine that if Valentina is on this consistent rise of getting better every time she fights, that, you know, Antonina is probably on the exact same training program, doing the exact same workouts, and probably getting better every single day by having to fight one of the best women fighters in the world and her sister. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. But I mean, there's, there's definitely issues with the gas tank, and we've definitely seen her not play such good defense at times, but I definitely, I, I would like to say that I think she's taken the time to go back to the drawing board, and I think we'll see a very good version of older Shevchenko on Saturday. I'm going to take the opposing view on this. Um, I think she's unspectacular. I mean, of course you are. Hey, there has to be some kind of diversity here, son. Amen, brother. Cheers. But, uh, yeah, I, I just I don't think she's really that great in any facet of the game. I mean, if we go back here, we're going to look at Andrea Lee, and you can see, from, I mean, multiple time kickboxing champion whatever you know obviously amateur oh and, and then, shout out shout out shreveport louisiana north boot andrea yeah. lee with the louisiana state golden gloves yeah but we're also talking about who's won tournaments in both kickboxing boxing and muay thai she's a very proficient striker Fair. and you know i dude you want to go see a fight go to youtube and type in Andrea Lee, and the first fight that pops up is the 2015 Five of the Year candidate with, uh, I forget her name, but, dude, she breaks this chick's arm three separate times. I'm talking tight arm bars, tight Kimura, and this girl just somehow slips out of it. Like, I'm talking her her hand was up like this, scratching the back of her head. And I was just like, sitting there, I was like, holy crap. Yeah. So she has mad submissions to go along with her uh, Muay Thai and kickboxing background. So that's why I'm taking the underdog here. I respect the underdog pick. Look, I, I've noticed that in the recent future, or in the recent past, excuse me, I've been, a, I've been leaning a little bit heavy favorite. So I think just in terms of probability, we hit on a lot of favorites last week in the UFC, not Bellator. But I'm thinking I'm thinking this week's probably going to be the week of the underdog. I'm taking Shevchenko because she's one of the favorites that I like. But, you know, I would not be surprised to see Andrea Lee come out and KGB her ass. Dude, uh, there's one thing. I look at this card – and there might not be a ton of huge names besides the top four guys, you know, Tony Ferg, uh, Benil Daryush, Michael Chandler, and Charles Oliveira. But you start looking into the matches that they made, congratulations, Mick Maynard, dude. These matches, almost all of them, for the exception of one that we'll get to on the men card, I think are going to be absolute wars. No, I, I would absolutely have to agree with you because – like you said, even though from a names perspective, this isn't loaded with every single UFC fighter that everybody knows. I think, like you said, solid matchups, and we're going to see really competitive mixed martial art competitions. I wouldn't be surprised if more than one of these went all three rounds, all five rounds. Ooh. Off the top again. <laughs> But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this was one of those nights where the casuals and the people that don't enjoy this as much go, oh, that was so boring. Nobody got knocked out. But at the end of the night, we're like, that was fireworks. That was freaking fantastic. I mean, obviously, I can't say how many people are going to knock out, but I can almost assure you that the matchups are going to be like just absolute fireworks, like you said. So moving on. 
we're yeah, going to talk about the uh, we're going to talk about the featured prelim, Jacare Souza versus who do we got? Ray Muniz. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so as you can see here, Jacare really respectable, twenty six and nine. Um, been in the octagon a while. He's a very very wily veteran. But He's as you can 41 see, pretty one now. Jacare is. I mean, as you can see, fought top to top, but he's on what, you know, five out of seven that he's lost? Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously, if you go back, he has quality wins, but... I mean, if you look at it by year, the only quality win he has in the last, you know, three or four years is I believe Derek Brunson was 2018 and Vitor Belfort was 2016. That's right. That's right. But I'm like... That's not that's not a lot of quality to say you walked away with wins in in the past recent future. I mean Weidman too, but like at the end of the day, he's fighting the best of the best and like cowboy. I just think it's kind of time to see Jacques hang it up in MMA. I'd love to see him go compete in grappling tournaments still and do jujitsu and you know express himself through mixed martial arts however he sees fit, but not in the UFC and not in a sport where. I think he's going to see his head get punched off again by Muniz. Uh, I think my concern personally is uh, the amount of damage he's taken recently, like especially at 41 years old. Like, yeah, he has some spectacular highlights, some spectacular knockouts and performances, but he's taken a lot of damage with him getting up in age. Obviously there's, you know, fighters out there that fight in their forties for titles are still very good you know Randy i think the shelf Jordan life of, almost 50 i think the shelf life of ufc fighters and mma fighters in general is a lot higher than most professional athletes however when you start getting battered like that at an older age it becomes a problem and that's why i think we're both gonna take the he's underdog right yeah Check. muniz is plus 105 and jacare is minus 125 so I think we're both going to come with the go with the up and comer. He's only had those two fights in the UFC and then the Contender Series fight, but he's he's only 31. So yeah. is 41. I think that's the difference there. Regardless of experience, regardless of intent, regardless of like we make fun of all the time, regardless of I'm going to go on a winning streak and get the title before I retire. I just think, you know. The young dog's always going to outrun the old dog in something like this. I'd love to see. Especially Jacare. off of steam. Yeah, I mean, if you go look at this, he's on a, what, a six-fight win streak so far? And yeah. uh, his last loss came in the uh, United Caucasian Fight Championships. Fun fact. Interesting. Yeah, I've never heard of that organization. Shout out to United Caucasian Fight Championships. No, I let Cow I let Cowboy fool me last week. I know we said we weren't going to talk about him anymore, but I let Cowboy fool me last week, and I'm not going to let Jacare do it to me this week. Especially because, like you said, I don't know how that man still doesn't have brain damage from how hard Kevin Holland punched him. Big Kevin Holland fan, I. But that, I mean, you know, that was he hit the he knocked the mess out of him, and then got up and proceeded to get two or three more good licks in before he was officially out or whatever you want to call it. So it's plus one you talk one twenty five for the underdog? Plus one oh five minus one twenty five for the favorite. So I'm gonna plus take me as a plus one oh five. I mean I'll, that's I'll almost even but you're not winning much, you know? That's what I was about to say, it's almost even, so yeah. At fifty bucks, win fifty five, you know, something like that. I I think we'll take the underdog on this one as well. So now uh, we'll, know, now we'll move on to the main card. And we got Shane Burgos versus Edson Barboozle. The, the greatest name in all of the UFC. I don't know when we came up with this, but Gage and I were watching some mixed martial arts, watching him fight one time, and said he kind of looked like a weasel. So Edson Barboozle will be the only thing you hear us refer to him as. No offense. Yeah, sorry, Barboozle. <laughs> Shane Burgos coming in at 13 and 2. Uh I believe they're fighting at Featherweight. This is a Featherweight matchup at Yeah, this is Featherweight. This is 45. 145. Yes, sir. 
I mean, we got a banger right here, folks, especially in lead off the card. Sheesh, this is going to, this is going to be a war in my opinion. And I, if there was a bet, a prop bet, like, Oh, is this going to be a war? Hell yeah. I bet all day. This is going to be a war. Shane no, Burgess I- will stand in the pocket, walk whoever the hell is in front of him down and throw. I On the absolutely- other side, you have Barbozel, <laughs> and this guy will do the same thing, except this guy has the nastiest kicks. Hey, the homage of this calf kick experience comes from Barbozel. This guy can kick the brakes off of anybody. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I agree with what you're saying about both guys because particularly looking at this fight, I don't imagine we're going to see them, you know, doing a lot of shooting and a lot of trying to wrestle each other. It's probably going to be a master class in striking. But kind of look, kind of going at what you said about Virgos being a backy down kind of fighter, he kind of looks like, you know, a smaller Jan Blahovich where he's kind of flat footed and he moves very straight ahead. He definitely packs a punch. He has power in both hands. But Absolutely. I think Barboozle is going to be quick. I think he's going to be moving around. And like you said, we talked about it earlier, but he's got at least two stoppages from leg kick damage. So I would yeah, not be surprised. If, I would not be surprised if we didn't see Barboozle via decision in this one myself, even though he's an underdog. Another plus 105, almost even, and Burgos is minus 125. Same odds as the fight before. I mean, you can see uh, Barboozle. I mean, he's got beat by some of the top guys. I mean, he's dropped back down to featherweight at 145. He fought Paul Felder and Justin Gaethje. Look at that. He beat Hooker by punches to the body. Oh, Hooker Hooker is one of my favorites and one of the toughest guys in the UFC. He's a tough guy. You're right. He made him quit, and this is a tough – one of my opinions, one of the toughest guys. Look, and um, then go back a little bit more. He beats Darush, Gilbert Melendez, and Pettis in a three-fight win streak. Come yeah. on now. I no, think Barbuzel's still got some in the tank. What is he, 36, 37? 37, yeah. He's 21. Barbuzel's nine. still got some in the tank for sure. And, like, I always like to look at, you know, how a fighter's – because I think win streaks and loss streaks – really do affect fighters um, and is a good indicator of how their next performance is going to be, all, although that's not always the case. But, dude, look at this. He faced a murderer's row of opponents since 2016. You got no, Anthony I think. Pettis, Gilbert Melendez, Dariush, Khabib, one of the greatest to ever do it, and he stuck in there till a decision. Wait, did he? Yeah, it wasn't a title fight. He went into decision with the uh, – Khabib, Kevin Lee, killer. Dan Hooker, killer. Justin Gaethje, killer. Felder Ige, all killers. Hold on, pause. I think that's the big fight to look at right there. 50K Dan Ige. I think, you know, looking at Burgos, they're not the same body type. Burgos is a little bit bigger. You know, Dan Ige is more of a shorter, stockier guy, kind of. But I think they kind of have that same style, almost kind of like Michael Chandler, like we'll touch on later, but guys that are very high pressure coming at you, moving forward the entire fight. And Barbuzel took Ige, who I think is better than Burgos, to a split decision. So I think at the end of the day, we're going to see Barbuzel walk out of here with a decision win. I'm going to go the opposite. I, I'm going to hammer down on Barbuzel. He's all, he's the underdog, right? Yeah. Yeah, hammer down on Barbuzel for one, crank that for two, head kick KO. He keeps his left hand down. Head kick KO would be sweet, but I'm with you. Hammer down on Barbuzel for the win, for sure. Should give that one. Hey, give that one the fucking work, son. I was about to say, anybody who's listening to this and not following me on at Zach Gleason, Zach underscore Gleason 76 on Instagram, flash, flash, I'm making my bet sheet right now figure out how much money I'm going to put on each fight and what I'm going to do with it and maybe give away a free pick or two. So keep your eyes open. But hammer down, Edson Barboozle, next fight. Caitlin Chahoonigan 
versus the blonde fighter. Yes, versus Vivian Arejo. Mm-hmm. All right, we got Chahoon again coming at 15 and four. She's fought the top of the top for the past three years now. Yeah, Jessica Ide, JoJo Collarwood, Jennifer Maya, Maya? Vin- the champion, the bullet, Shevchenko. Her oh, baby Shevchenko. sister gave her baby sister the work. You got Jessica and Josh. You know, you got the top of the top that Chahoogan's faced and, you know, even coming out on top on some. Versus uh, the newcomer coming in at 10 and 2, Vivian Arejo. Here we see Roxanne Modafari again. I was about she's to say, our I, other two, she's beat our other two people that we've already talked about. She is very good. She's agreed. lost to Jessica I, though. She's also only been in the UFC for two years now. Um, but this is going to be interesting because Vivian hits like a Mack truck. Oh, my dude. That is absolutely what I was getting ready to say. She hits hard. For what? 115? For 115 pound girl, she knocks the lights out of these chicks. And that's not, that's not easy to do. You'll have a hard time fighting men at 125, put another man out. She does that 115 pounds as a woman. You know what's you know what's crazy is Chikugian is a fantastic wrestler and grappler, but she hasn't had she had a takedown she had three of them against Shevchenko last year, but she hasn't had a single takedown in any of her other eleven UFC fights. And then she's a really good you know boxing defender. She plays good defense. She protects herself and she moves. But she doesn't hit. She doesn't hit very hard. She has just two knockout wins. So you know, I think maybe she has a shot if this one comes to decision. But I, I'm kind of thinking Vivi's going to catch her, and we're this one might be a good little knockout here for us with the 115ers. Give us the odds, Z Bone. Let's see. I got Chikugian minus 145, and Vivi as the dog at plus 120. I like I like plus one twenty. We're going to the underdogs here, son. I was about to say I don't know if I'm going to hammer this one, but it's definitely going to be a pick, and it's definitely going to, going to catch some money. I was thinking about maybe parlaying Antonina Shevchenko and Vivi together as a as a dual bet to even my odds up pretty good, especially because you know, like I I think I have some UFC knowledge. I think I think I like to talk it, and I think people like to listen every once in a while, but Probably not my most knowledgeable of fights to pick on, even though I think we got some good points. I, speaking from personal experience, you know, most of the fights that go on are UFC and they fight the men uh, fight the most often. And, yeah. you know, in my opinion, there's a lot more top men. There's like there's a few women that you see out there, but they're not on the cage on a consistent basis, not necessarily all of them. So it's hard to get a read from just, you know, live spectating on them. So yeah. it takes a lot more research to get to know these women. So, I mean, I, I'm going to go with the underdog here. I've liked what I saw from her. And I think she has real power. No, and like you said, you don't always get a chance to see necessarily the top contenders that fight in the women divisions. And you don't always necessarily get to see, you know, the fireworks where you see the big 260 pound guy ripping a dude's head off. But I think if we're looking at this card and these matchups through and through, these are four of the most badass women in the world. And I think we're definitely going to be in for a show. No. Yeah. I mean, they obviously, I think that I think the matchmakers have to work a lot harder with the women's divisions than they do at the, with the, with the men's to produce a um, a good fight. Agreed. But uh, let's go ahead and move on. Next. Yeah, we got the late step in. Matt Schnell versus Rogerio Bonatorin. Yeah. Step in our, back Hermanson. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see what happened there? One of the guys on Hermanson's camp, one of the guys in his crew got COVID. Did he really? Yeah, Hermanson didn't test positive ever, so they literally moved the fight to next week. Like, it's they literally moved it to the 22nd on the 
Garbrandt, uh, Rob Font fight night. Don't get me started on that one, son. So who was who's his opponent again? Jack Rob? Hermanson versus Edmund Shabazian. Ah, okay, okay. We'll we'll get to that one next week. Yeah, we'll talk. I got about a lot. I got a lot to say about those two. But Shabazian's a dude. We'll we'll get to that one next week. Tune in next week to see see our picks on that one. But for He's now, coming back. We're going back to Matt Schnell versus Danger uh, Schnell. Hogerio Monitorin. Sorry, I just butchered that name. All I know is R is pronounced H in Portuguese. So interesting. So, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, so we got Matt Schnell coming in at 15 and 5. He's won what three, four, five out of the last six. Last yeah. loss to Alexander Pantoja, which is a quality opponent, especially at 125. Tyson Nam, also a very good name at 125. And then, I'm, fun fact, Luke, he beat the shit out of Luke, Luca, or Luis Smolka. He's Smolka's fighting. He's a good fighter, too. Yeah, yeah. He, I watched that fight earlier today. He beat the brakes off of him, and that wasn't even close. And then they're going, uh, just a little side note here, Sugar Sean's facing this guy. And I I don't That's know how cool. like, how how long y'all want to bet out. Bet the fucking house on the Sugar Show versus Luis Smolka. Anywho. Yeah, we, that's July. We still got at least six more shows before we get to the Sugar Show again. <laughs> don't get me started. I fucking love that dude. All right. Awesome. It, obviously, his biggest name that he has uh, faced is Rob Font, you know, top tier contender. For yeah. the Bantamweight division, I believe he's number six or seven. He's coming up next week versus Snow Love. And he lost in the Ultimate Fighter in 2016. But, uh, yeah, he's on a pretty good win streak right here. Yeah. And I'm personally picking him. He has great submissions. Not great stand-up. Serviceable. Almost solid stand-up. He, he can hold his own is what I'm trying to say. You're and talking about Snow, team. correct? Yeah, on Schnell. On yeah. to Bon and Torin, we have him at 16 and three, dropping two of his last three, two in a row. Um, oh, also, wait, wait, wait. Very- Let me cut you off real quick. You know how we were talking about these guys being top flyweights? Yeah. Schnell is usually a pretty big flyweight, but they're fighting at 130. They're fighting at Bantamweight. They're 135 in it. Oh, Okay. I knew I'd seen that somewhere, but I had to look it up and double check to make sure before I said it. Because but I'm pretty sure both of them usually fly, fight flyweight, so I just assumed it was a flyweight bout. I, I have no idea. And before you get into it, just to win outright, the odds are Schnell at minus 164 and Bonatorin at plus 134. But so I think I'm with you. I think I'm taking Schnell the favorite. If things end up playing out the way I imagine they're going to play out, I think you and I might have the exact same bet card this week, minus Andrea Lee. Oh, and Burgos. You took Burgos. Or no, I didn't take Burgos. I was about to say, never mind. I, uh, never mind, never mind. Yeah, what the hell? I didn't take no Burgos. Anywho, from what I've seen, I like Matt Chanel here. I think he has a good overall game. His ground game is very good, in my opinion. Now, on Bonnet Torrin. His ground game just finish also very fight. good. This, is, this was my pick for the one that wasn't going to be a banger. It's going to be a good fight, don't get me wrong, but it's not going to be a stand-up war like the other fights on the card, in my opinion. Um, from what I saw from Bond and Torn, though, especially with you saying that it's going to be at 135, um, dude, he is fucking stacked. He's diced to the fucking socks. Yeah. Let's take a look at it. What he uh, he's at what sixty? All right, five five and you know obviously this fight's going to be at one thirty five. Five five and one thirty five is pretty damn big, son. Yeah. But uh, he has. They both have great jujitsu. You know, there's no there's no um, doubt about that on either side. So it'll be interesting to see since they both know that they're good on the ground to see who will win the stand-up. I, I just think Schnell finishes fights. That's the big thing. You look at his history, you look at his, you know, his fight record. 
whether it's submission and we're talking about that ground game you mentioned, or, you know, his, his stand-up's really not bad either. He's won plenty by TKO, by KO, yeah. by punches. So that's where I think he's, like you said, I think they're both very equal on the ground. I think they're both willing to do it on the ground. Not that's what she said, but I think Schnell is going to have a little bit better stand-up game, and I think that's what's going to really make the difference. That I, you know, that's the same thing I said about Jacare. I forgot before we started the show, is that you know part of the reason I think Kevin Holland beat him was because Kevin Holland was so comfortable with letting him be on top. Kevin Holland was a black belt jujitsu guy, comfortable with being on his back. Andre Muniz is, I don't know if he's a black belt, but he's also high level jujitsu. I don't think Jacare putting him on his back is going to disturb him that much. But regardless, no. I think we're going to have a lot of guys and a lot of, you know, women that can do jujitsu and that can do the ground game. So I think a lot of these fights are going to come down to who's the better stand up. Yeah. I mean, like, like, uh, I mean, I already discussed why I think that uh, Schnell is going to take, take the dub here. But yeah. I, I think if there's one one pick to fight here that's not going to be as great, it's going to be this one, in my opinion. But uh, yeah. where, where are the odds again for this one? Minus 165 for Schnell and plus 135 for Bonatorin. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say hammered down on this one by any stretch of the means. This no, is, but uh, if there's this, is pretty, pick this is probably one of the biggest spreads, huh? Uh, yeah, you know, these, these lines are just as of today and they'll shift up until Saturday night, the way the money goes in. Yeah. But, you know, this is a pretty fat one. Tony Ferg was getting fatter as I watched it and Olivero was actually growing too, but we'll get there when we get there. Let's talk about Fergie and Darius. Let's talk about the co-main event. Let's move it. Let's do it. All right. right. Introducing our fighters. Let's see how they've done. All right. So we got Ferguson coming at 25 and 5 overall on a two fight skid. But I mean, just look at these names, son. It was I mean, 12 in are... a row before that. 12 in a row. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at this. Since 2015, for the past five years, he's fought the who's who in the lightweight division and has, you know, up until last May, was. The guy, the guy that was going to take down Khabib. However, that's obviously changed that war with Justin Gaethje. But I think no. that changes you as a person. To be completely honest, you know, that was a fantastic fight, and I don't think enough people talk about Ferguson versus Gaethje. But I think when you get hit in the face that many times in one night, that – I mean, why does Tony Ferguson – want to do this anymore is the question I want to ask him if it's if you know like if there's a serious motivation there and there's a motivating factor where you know Dana said Tony's right back in the picture if he can beat Darush but you know I think that whole psychological thing we talked about before we started the show was going to play a factor here I think oh yeah absolutely but you got the, look Tony's not getting finished like you even in the Gagey fight, when he did get finished, he was on his feet, and he was still throwing back. Like he's, he was trying, man. I'll give he, him that. Tony Ferguson's the, toughest. the toughest motherfuckers. Yeah, exactly. He's the one of the toughest motherfuckers that I've ever seen in the whole fucking sport. And this is a sport of only tough motherfuckers. And, uh, I mean, just go back to his last fight. Disappointing, yes. The Charles Oliveira fight with – and that happened in December. I didn't watch it personally while it was live. I went back and watched it. Bro, how the hell did he – he literally let this man just destroy his arm and said, all right, let's go four more rounds. And he did. It was it was ridiculous. Like, he's so tough. No, Tony Ferg is absolutely that dude when it comes to just being durable. But, we, you know, we talk about it all the time at some point for everybody that chin cracks and I'm not saying that it has yet but I'm also not not pondering if we're not getting close to that point because you know like Tony Ferguson his entire career has been 
the dominant wrestler in the fights that he's gone into. He's been an incredible wrestler, and Charles Oliveira literally tossed him around like a rag doll. Yeah. I think that's going to be a problem. You know, Darush can do the ground and pound. He's a very good wrestler as well. And I think it's, you know, they're Charlie Olives and Darush are big 55ers. Tony's kind of a skinny, tall, longer guy. Let me let me interject here. Um, shout out to Uncle Chell, first of all, big bad guys ink guys. Um, but he was saying that uh, Tony switched camps. He, uh, I mean, obviously it's late in his career for him to do that. But uh, Freddie Roach is, you know, world renowned for his boxing techniques and his coaching. So Tony, like to allude to that, I alluded to earlier in the show, Tony, maybe. He's been with him four months. Maybe he's learned some head movements. It's always, in my opinion, been one of his downfalls. He'll just stand in front of you, get hit, but will crack back. Maybe he learned some head movements. But like we are talking earlier, with the hands being down low, it's always allowed him to be a, a very good striker with his legs. So It's always allowed him to be very mobile. And, you know, Tony Ferguson does very strange things in the octagon. Absolutely. Tony but Ferguson we'll, might be the hardest fight in the UFC to train for because he might be one of the most, un, you know, maybe outside of Pereira, that dude's a freaking hurricane. Or, you know, Prajaka is pretty, pretty wild when it comes to the striking. But, you know, you can't, you, you can't find a guy to spar against that's going to mimic Tony Ferguson. That's just not abs- going to happen. Absolutely. So it'll be interesting to see if Tony's changed his style, maybe uh, more defensive oriented. But I think. I'm speaking for both of us here. You might want to correct me if I'm wrong. I think our boy Benel Daryush, the Iranian, is going to come through with the victory at? At minus 145. Tony's plus 120 at the dog. So, you know, if you were looking for a value pick on this card where it was like, we've, we've taken plenty of dogs. There's plenty of underdog picks, but a value pick where it's like, let me take an underdog and see what happens. Why not have it be this one? Regardless, Benil Darush is a stone cold killer. That he dude walks, comes he in. He walks. I mean, he down comes down in and does beats. business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, he's on one, two, what, fucking five fight win streak, and he's looked dominant in all of them. He has the ground game to keep up with Tony. You know, he has the power. So, I mean. I think I think you go with the uh, the favorite here, in my opinion. I agree. I'm thinking I'm thinking Benil Darush, and I'm thinking it's probably going to end up being pretty convincing, just because you know most of Tony Ferguson's fights in the past three or four years have been five round fights. That fight in December against Oliveira was his first three round fight in however long. So you know maybe he learns how to pace himself, but I've always considered Tony to be a slow starter which is not something that will put you at an advantage in a shorter fight. So I think Benil starts working on him early, and Tony might come on late and kind of, you know, pull on a Neil Magny where he steals the fight at the end. But I would I would much more convincingly think Darush gets a TKO by punches at some point. No, I, I, I 100% agree with you on that one. Tony is a very slow starter, and, you know, he's been in main events – for the past few years now, and then you can't drop the first round, even if it's you just getting warmed up in a three-round bout. That means you have no uh, option than to take two and three. So I think, I think we're pretty uniform on that. I think one of the things about Tony, too, is we talk about him being a very composed guy and one of those guys that doesn't let the moment get to him. But I think Tony – as well as us as fans know what this fight means, where it's like, no, he's probably not going to get cut if he loses again, but we're probably never going to see Tony Ferguson, the undisputed champion of the world, if he loses again. So I think, you know, while that could be a motivating factor and work positively for for some people, I think kind of like Dom Reyes showed, once you, once you kind of get desperate and you start feeling that pressure and needing a win, you throw a reckless strike or something and then you get caught with something that makes you look real bad. So I would like to see Tony stay patient, use his new Freddie Roach boxing defense, but 
I have a strong, strong feeling he's going to lose the first round and do something to get his ass dropped in the second round. Uh, I mean, I agree with you. I don't think he's taking this one home. So let's move into the main event. Let's UFC get it, buddy. 62 for the belt. All right. Introducing our fighters, we have Michael Chandler coming in for the lead, lightweight champion of the freaking world, coming in at 22 and 5, former three time Bellator lightweight champion versus his opponent. Coming in with a 30 and 8 record, coming on a big seven fight win streak. We have Charles Charles Oliveira, baby. (laughs) All right, let's, uh, Zach, let's start it up. I'll give you the odds first. Let's start there. Oliveira is the favorite at minus 140. And Michael Chandler is the dog at plus 115. So if I'm hitting a hammer bet and I'm calling a big money bet, Michael Chandler at plus 115. Jim Adler, the Texas hammer that motherfucker down. I mean, come on. I think that I think the way this fight plays out, if we're gonna be real honest, Michael Chandler's gonna do what Michael Chandler does. Come out, immediate pressure, immediate. I have an endless gas tank and I want this belt worse than you do so i'm going to give you everything i got for all five rounds he's going to take the center of the octagon and i think charlie olives is a very creative fighter he can do a little bit of everything at a very high level so i think you know it's not going to be a one minute two minute ko it's not going to be you know 60 seconds of work and let me fight again in three months it's going to be a little bit of work for Michael Chandler, but Charlie Olives isn't going to do the Dan Hooker move where he circles around. He's going to stand his ground and they're going to trade. But at the end of the day, we can go back and forth a little bit, but I'm going to, I'm going to call Chandler by first round KO. He's going to put him down cold, I think. All right. Bold statements by the greasy Gator Gleason over here, son. I say, what do I say? All right. Look, I'm not going to argue with him. I think he's correct about Chandler winning. However, let me give you my reasons why I think Chandler's going to win. One, he is a great wrestler. One of the best in all of mixed martial arts. And he has power. He's stocky. He He's not as tall as Oliveira. Oliveira's going to have a reach on him, and he's going to have size on him. But Chandler is stocky. I have a extremely hard time thinking that Chandler is even going to be on the ground unless he gets dropped by a punch, but I don't see it happening either. So, you know, we're talking about Oliveira, who has the most submission victories in the UFC, all-time, no matter division. If he's not on the ground, how are you going to submit him? Like, there's very few options. You got to stand in guillotine, and that's about it. I don't see that happening. I don't think even Chandler wants to take this ground. He no. showed he stood in the pocket with one of the best lightweights that a brawler. Just, World, yeah. The Hoker Not will tested. stand with anybody in trade. And Hoker took a shot. I mean, no, Hooker. Chandler took a shot from Hooker and returned fire and knocked his lights up. So, I mean, I, I think also another factor that you have to take into consideration here is that Chandler has – even though this is his second UFC fight, he's been facing top, top competition in Bellator for years. Two wins over Patricky Pitbull. He lost his belt to Patricio, which is one of the greatest in the world, in my opinion. He kind of got caught, though, that first time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, Benson Henderson had wars with Benson. Beat Eddie Alvarez? Eddie Alvarez. I'm... Let's see. Let's just to show you people. Look, man. I mean, so we're Benson talking about Benson Henderson Dan twice, Hooker. Eddie Alvarez twice, Patricky Pitbull twice, Brett Primus twice. I just noticed that. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, the Will Brooks fights. Yeah, that's also six years ago. And if you listen to Joe Rogan's podcast, I mean, he ta- he talks about how he reinvented himself after those fights. He um. 
gave himself a new mindset, kind of did a, a Zen thing. But like, look, these are like, even though this is a Bellator, he was a three time champion. He's seen the spotlight, been in five round fights his entire life. You know, NCAA, uh, I'm not sure if he was a champion or not, but look. Yeah, he was, I think. Yeah, or think champion. Uh, I, I can't, I don't know. But like, obviously, top tier wrestler. And look, if you go over to uh, Oliveira's side, just to prove my point, like, yeah, he's on a 7 5 win streak. As Tony Fur, which has been on a slide, Kevin, Kevin, Lee. No, Kevin Lee's no slouch. But then look at this. I mean, his last no, moment that was, that was good was Paul Felder. Good fight, in my opinion. I'll beat Will Brooks, though. So. I'm just kidding. Yeah, all right. Lost to Anthony not. Pettis in a war, lost to Max Holloway. But you also got to think, these were all at featherweight. And that's back when Charlie, he was having weight problems. He wasn't making 45 easily at all because he's a big guy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's had one loss at lightweight since he moved up, and that was to Paul Felder. That was the first one, huh? Or was Brooks at lightweight? Let me go back real quick. Uh, Will Brooks, return to lightweight. Yeah. Okay. Will Brooks is at lightweight. But I got I two just, things. I, don't, I think there's too big of a gap in the striking. I know, like, there, no offense to Oliveira, he's a good striker. But it's not I his strength. I haven't seen him sit people down. He has. He definitely has in the past. But it's not his strength. It's not his go-to. And my two things. One, I'm sure I've probably mentioned this on an episode before. But half of being a good wrestler in mixed martial arts and using that to your advantage is striking the fear of being taken down into your opponent. Half the guys Khabib got down, Justin Gaethje, world-class wrestler. But Justin Gaethje had the fear of the takedown in his mind, and he was doing everything to prevent being taken, taken down, which put him in position to be taken down. I think, I think Michael Chandler has no fear of wrestling with Oliveira because he thinks he's the better, better wrestler. So I think Charlie Olive's probably going to have no intention of trying to take this to the ground, especially – because to hit on your point, Michael Chandler is kind of like a bowling ball. Like, there's not a whole lot of things you're going to be able to do to him in that short, stocky body, like, type, where you're going to get him to tap. I mean, maybe you could bulldog, ch- like, choke his head off, but I don't really see that happening. I yeah, think- I mean, I, obviously, there's going to be a new lightweight champion this weekend, and I think this is, like – I wasn't 100% in on it, to say the least, when they announced this for the vacant title. I thought there was other options. But now the more I look at it, I'm like, this is a test for both guys. Like, And both guys are top five, no doubt about it. And to show who the best is, I think this is the perfect fight. No, I think think Charlie Olives is going to come out, and I think he's going to try to get started quick because he's not a guy that likes to – do the dance around game and take fights late into him. He wants to get in, finish, and be done. Yeah. But that's also kind of the way Michael Chandler is. I think Charlie Olives having the reach advantage, you know, his his strength isn't going to that, you know, front hand jab and touching guys up. His strength is to use his legs. He's a better kicker than he is a puncher. And I think he's going to come out and try to do the leg kicks, the front body kicks. But there's only two ways that you can really deal with that as a fighter. You can either A, check it, or B, throw a straight bomb right down the middle. So I think that's what's going to end up happening towards the end of the first round. Charlie Olives is going to try to throw a leg kick. His hands are going to be down. Chandler's going to come with a big right down the pipe and end his night. (sighs) Ain't a better sound in the world. But just to recap, now that we touched on our main event of the evening, We're going to hammer down together on Michael Chandler at plus 115. We're going to pick Benny Darush at minus 145. We are going to hit on Schnell at minus 165. Both of us have a hammer on Vivi at plus 120. I have a hammer on Andre Muniz at plus 105 and Gage is in there. And then we split the first prelim of the night. So the first prelim of the night, one of us is going to be a loser. 
on, so on one of us is gonna be one loser by one fight. Yeah, one of us is gonna win love this that. weekend by one fight. <laughs> oh, I love on, that. Andrea Lee versus Antonina Shevchenko at plus one forty five and minus one seventy five for the bullet's older sister. But yeah. With that being said, Gage, toss us into our last segment. All right. We got the championship five-minute round five roundup, son. Let's get it. Let's hit it. We already touched on the Verdum controversy in New Jersey. We already touched on Rumble Johnson identity theft. So I think the next big thing we definitely got to hit on is Floyd Mayweather and Jake Paul. Got your hat? What was that, man? That was kind of funny. I mean, really, we're talking about a guy that uh, that stole his hat and then got punched in the face for it. Like, as a publicity cut. stunt? Like, are you kidding me? Like, he ate an is it worth getting him the face? One of the greatest boxers in the world with no yeah. gloves. Yeah. Like, open hand. Yeah. That, that's ridiculous, man. I mean, why would you do that? You got yourself kicked out of your brother's fight just for a publicity stunt. I guess maybe if it gets you more pay pay per view buys though. It just kind of. Like, you're an older brother. You're an oldest child, like I am. So I can only imagine that it would kind of suck that we're at my press conference doing my fight. You just had your big moment where you made a bitch ton of money and did the whole Ben Askren thing. Yeah. This is my moment, and you steal all the publicity and all the headlines because you want to pull Floyd's hat off his head. I mean. There was an Uncle Chael. We'll go back and mention him again. He had made a point about there might have been a little behind the scenes, something that we don't know about because Floyd always wears his TMT, the money team hat. And he was not wearing a TMT hat when this happened. So interesting theory. But at the end of the day, that fight just doesn't make sense, man. Floyd versus There's a 30 Logan. pound weight difference and like six, six inch height difference. I mean, yeah, amateur boxer take on one of the greatest in the world, both for money grads. It's like there is no incentive on either side besides greed. No, amen. Did you see the presser yesterday where Dana White tried to push John Jones onto Stipe? I did not see the presser, but I know John Jones said, hell no. Yeah, they and were. They-, they basically came out and said they're probably going to do Ngannou versus Lewis, and then throw Stipe to the Wolves and give him John Jones before he gets back to Francis, which I think is an intriguing fight. But I think John Jones, like, you know, we've talked about him a bunch. He's like the Tamaya where he makes an appearance on every episode. I think John Jones deserves that Francis fight. I think he deserves to get paid at least somewhere in the $10 million range if they're going to sell all the pay-per-views that they are. But, you know, I, 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 like as a fight fan, I was a fan of good fights. I think, one, Jones versus Stipe. I would love to see that. Lewis versus Ngannou. Round one, like, the first fight that they had, awful. Not my favorite. They were literally they booing and throwing shit at them. It was so bad. But yeah. I think they've both gotten significantly better since then. I think we see a completely different fight the second time around. Yeah. I mean, like, where do you even go? I mean, uh, obviously, I think even the casuals want to see Jones being gone for the baddest man on the planet. Um, yeah. And, like, even, like, like I, I I guess, okay, John Jones coming for, like, more money. He, he wants more money. But, like, if you're – if you are Dana White in this situation, you see that Lewis versus Ngannou – is going to make half the money that Jones versus Ngannou would make. So I, I don't know. Maybe this is a, a strategy, a business tactic on the UFC's part to, to try to get a closer number for John Jones to agree to. Maybe so. I agree. I just – I think John deserves somewhere in terms of $10 million total, not $10 million to fight. You know, give, give him $5 million on the contract to fight, and then hopefully he can generate – two or three million dollars of pay-per-view revenue because they sell so many so yeah of course and i think i think you have I've, that's what everyone wants to see look I, I i i like heavyweights they're a lot of fun to watch because there's knockouts involved but there's also heavyweight fights that just completely suck ass 
I'd have to say that heavyweights are, are one of the most boring divisions just because uh, I think fighters fight tentatively, unfortunately. And that is time. That is five minutes for our five-minute championship round five last-minute news podcast. I think I think we said everything we need to say this week. You got anything left, partner? I got nothing except tune in next week for a banger for No Love versus Font. No Love versus Font, Hermanson versus Shabazian, recap of this weekend, and more easy cash money in the bank brought to you by Shithead Sportsbook Incorporated. So this is the CKE Calf Kick Experience. Zach and Gage, signing out.